Hey there. Oh, I came in right on the break. Well, we got lots of more good tunes coming up. Wait a minute. So, welcome to the stream. Happy Saturday, wherever you're watching from. My name is Carl, and I'm here to talk about some data science and Python coding while I listen to music. And this is my first time in the new uh, game uh, section of Twitch, the software and game development. I forget, is this a channel or a, or a what? <laughs> or a, a game. It's like software and game development is a game. But I'm in software and game development, and I figured I might as well, you know, take advantage of the specific designation they gave us live coders uh, instead of getting lumped in with, like, the animal watchers and stuff. We are now in software and game development, not just science and technology. But anyway, <clears throat> thank you for joining me. Let me get into some of the actual content and stuff. Once a day. Uh, my name is Carl, and I'm a data scientist in the Bay Area of California. Um, I wrote that book. I'll tell you about it in a second. But in my streams, I do some data science work with Python, so that's where the coding comes in. And the first part of my stream, I always just talk through some basic background, you know, kind of telling you about, you know, what, what this is all about. What is fighting churn with data, and why does it have that weird picture of a woman in old-fashioned, you know, outfit on the cover? <laughs> so, to dive into the talking, I'll talk for about 10 minutes, and then I'll hit the code and the data more. Turning down the music volume just a touch. I don't know how it is for you. It was a little bit loud for me. Let me know on the chat how the music sounds. If you have a preference, louder, too loud, let me know. So, sounds good for me. What is churn? That mysterious word. Churn is when people unfollow, quit, cancel, or unsubscribe. You know, there's a lot of different words for it depending on what business you're in. But it always means that your customers, if you want to come back, don't come back. So you're bummed. So churn is bad. Churn is customers leaving. And it came from a measurement called the churn rate. Um, which I'll talk about at some point, maybe not in this stream. I don't know churn rates in this stream, but it's the percentage of customers that quit. Uh, and it comes from the meaning of churn for turnover. Churn means to turn over or mix. And if your, your customers are churning, it means like they're quitting and new ones are joining. So churn cancels out growth. So not just a rate anymore, churn is also now a verb. And you can say the customer churned, or I'm going to churn on Netflix because I couldn't find anything good to watch there. Um, and you can also use it as a noun. And you can say, that customer is a churn. You know, they cancel their contract. Or, like, uh, make a report, a churn report, a report of last quarter's churns. So that's a very common, uh, common thing to say. Anyway, so what is Fighting Churn with Data? Um, it's a book I wrote based on my experience at a company called Zuora which was like a subscription management and billing platform. So they have hundreds, like a thousand or more companies running subscriptions. So all those companies had a churn problem. And as the chief data scientist there, I worked with many of them, dozens, uh, dozens and dozens of companies to analyze their data and figure out why cus customers churn and why they come back. So the book is pretty much, you know, all the experience I could get, all the knowledge I could transfer in a uh, kind of too long book. Sorry for that. It's like 350 pages. So it ended up being long and kind of expensive, but I did my best. It wasn't intentional, but there's a discount code here. Don't full, pay full price. There's discount codes. And my publisher regularly has even larger discount codes than that, though not much. I think you can get like a 45% discount if you, if you look around. Anyway, so that's what the book is. Now, what is fighting churn? 
with data really mean? <laughs> now that's, it's a cute phrase, it's the title of a book, but it really means data-driven churn reduction. So that means using your data to reduce the churn from your product or service. Now, how do we usually do that? Well, the best way to reduce churn is make a great product. If people love your product, they won't churn, right? So that's good, but how do you use data? Well, you can use data to see what parts of the product people like and what, you know, maybe they don't like, if there's anything they don't like, or are, are, there are things in the product driving people away in some other subtle way. There's a lot of weird stuff that goes on. But anyway, you can use the data to analyze your product without doing a survey because churn is like a survey. Every customer votes or get, they answer one question, stay or go, but every customer answers the question every time they have to renew. All right, you can also do targeted marketing. Use your data to send customers messages that actually is valuable to them rather than just spam. So you gotta analyze what features they're using, what they're not using, to segment them into groups that you can then make targeted messaging. Customer success means helping out customers in need. You can use your data to figure out which customers need help. And lastly, well, not quite lastly, but lastly for now, sales and pricing. Use your data to come up with a good pricing plan. Don't give out discounts to fight churn. Um, you give out discounts to get customers to sign up, but not to stay. That's kind of like a, a myth or not always the best thing. Maybe in retail it works. I mean, retail, you'll give out discounts every now and then. Uh, it's part of a retail strategy, but not for subscription or, well, anyway, that's not a strategy for like a YouTube channel, right? They don't have a price. All right, why learn about this? Well, if you want to learn data science, this is the most common data science problem in the world today. Pretty much every company out there has a churn problem because they all want to keep their customers coming back. Um, but there are some special tips and tricks for churn, you know, some things that aren't quite like other data and analysis problems. It's also a cool way to learn data science foundations. So if you're new to data science, this is a cool way to get started. Um, if you follow my book, you'll kind of go from raw data all the way to uh, actionable results. Um, well, not quite actionable because there's no real churn, there's no real company for you to work on, you know, in the book. But there is data for you to work on, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. Okay, this is a new section of my stream where I'm just going to run through some thank yous for people who uh, followed me recently. Let's see, got to get this working. Thank you, Molar Oaj, for following me. Don't worry, I'm not too popular. There aren't too many follows to go through from the past week. But thank you, Thuthu Quinn. Is that working? I never have, oh, there we go. Thuthu Quinn, thank you for following me. And I hope you see this stream and hear my shout out. Next, thank you, Nyla Dazai. This thing is so slow. I need to come up with jokes to say in between the, the the following. Nyla Dazai, thank you for following. Next. Uh, data science jokes. There are two kinds of data scientists. Thank you, Marco3141592. And I wonder what is that mysterious number, Marco? We're, we're really wondering. Is that your phone number, uh, zip code, or who knows? All right. And next, thank you. Darshank 98. That's a good one. A fine year, 1998. Next, thank you to Dow Dow Dow. Come on, don't make me look bad. Replay thingy. Dow Dow Dow. Thank you for following. And we just got one more. So if this is if this is seeming tedious to you, thank you to. Thank you, Pawarbi. Thank you for following, and I hope you see this stream and hear my shout out. So, welcome to the little data science group that I've got going here. I hope it stays interesting for you. I'll try to keep it fresh, keep the good tunes playing, and some good data learning happening. All right, next, where's the data? Whoops, hey, I didn't want to go to that. Where's the data? You know, I lost this section of my stream and I feel like I have to start doing this again because I talk so much at the beginning. Let's look at some data. 
So what data are we talking about? There's a social network simulation. I mentioned uh, earlier that you don't get to really fight churn at a company by reading my book because I don't have a company handy. But we have some simulated data that you can use to learn the concepts of churn. And you simulate it. It's called, the simulation is called Social Net 7 because I had one through six came before it. And I'm sure one day there will be an eight, nine, and 10. It's the nature of data science and software development that you have many versions of things. So in the data, um, there are subscriptions. So it's like a subscription uh, simulation. So you can see there's account IDs and they all have these subscriptions with start and end dates. So that's the first piece of data that we're going to use. And this is a number account ID number two. Look, account ID number two, well, they all churn at some point, which is when their subscriptions end. So you can see the date when these guys churn right here. You could, there's also account information, although I don't, we're not going to look at it too closely today. So this is telling you what we know about these customers. So again, it's simulated, so don't worry. This is not real customer data. <laughs> no one's real data was used or exposed or had anything to do with creating you know, this. So we have this f facts about the accounts also listed by their ID, uh, the app store, the date of birth, and the country that they're in. And like I said, not real data. Now those are interesting, but we need to know more about customers to fight churn. I said we were gonna like look at what parts of the product they like and don't like. So for that, we actually use events. Whoops, sorry, event. Which actually shows things that customers did. Now this is actually not that useful because the events are just identified by a type. Let's see, I can do a quick join um, on the event type table to make that a little bit more interesting. If I can remember the column names, uh, looks like event type ID, yep, equals E dot. Uh, mm -hmm, I guess it would be this one, right? Yeah, there we go. Now here, whoops. Inner join, uh, oh, join. Oh, I forgot the on statement. Here we go. Live debugging. You know, even experts like miss their stuff <laughs> when other people are looking. Not that I'm such an expert or anything. But now you can see the events in the social network simulation. There are posts, new friends, likes, ad views, and dislikes. All part of the data. This is actually the raw data. Um, the, uh, the underlying event and subscription data that is part of the simulation. And that's what we're gonna be uh, analyzing. And we're gonna look at things like, why do posts and new friends make people stay? And how do ad views and disliking make people churn? So there's a little data preview. I think that's probably enough of a data preview for now. Um, what we do with this data is we actually make a data set by analyzing it. So these are the raw underlying events for account number one. And you can see there's a long series of events just for account number one. Well, I can also show you if I ordered them by the event time, we'd see some other accounts. Um, I should have put a limit statement on this. Whoops, and I should also complete my SQL statements. So now we can see there's actually I mean, whoops, a bunch of other accounts. Wow, this 478 seems pretty busy, but then we've got other accounts and they all have their different events, you know, intermingled in this database. So then what we do is we take those events out and put them into a data set. Oh, well, first to back up, if you wanna get this set up yourself, if you wanna get this data for yourself to run the simulation and run the coding exercises we're gonna do, uh, these are your instructions. So I have a GitHub repo, crawl 24K, fight churn. Um, you do have to install uh, Python and a database called Postgres, which is what we were just looking at here. Well, this is just a, a, a UI tool for querying Postgres, but 
So you have to do those setup steps. Then you can either clone the code from GitHub, or I should mention, you can also pip install um, the code now. Fight Shern is the name of the package. Um, although if you're gonna actually edit the code and kind of work on it like we're doing today, um, you need to clone it. And in particular, that the uh, that what we're actually doing today is not in the package yet, because we're doing new code developments. So actually, let me just go to GitHub and get in the record uh, what the branch we're doing here is. So if I get to my GitHub page, um, I am working in a branch now, which is the transformer branch. So I started it last week, 2021-0911, transformers is the name of the branch on the GitHub repo. So that's how to, uh, if you wanna actually do this code yourself, um, you do have to run a data simulation so that you'll have all that data in your Postgres database too. That's kind of a given. So a little bit of setup here, but if you're, if you're really into this stuff and if you're a technology person, this only takes like 15 minutes or something. Um, I can probably do it in like under 10 minutes myself. If you don't simulate a lot of data, if you simulate a, a small data set, it can just take a couple of minutes. The default is a slightly larger data set. Um, well, so anyway, here's an overview of what the data set looks like um, what, or once you have created it. And this is shown in a series of statistics measured on the data set. So is churn is like the outcome of who churns and who doesn't. And in this data set, we've got a 4% monthly churn rate, which is okay. You know, that's not great. It's not terrible, but you know, it's a social network. So there's simulated to be a lot of churn. Then these are the metrics or features of the data set, like per month, new friend per month, etc. post per month. So all those events that we were just looking at in the database end up with a metric or feature in the data set, which is a summary for each account of, um, of uh, what you know, what they did in the last month. So that's why it's called per month, right? And we can look at the data set in just a sec. So this is showing likes per month average, that's the mean of 95, new friend per month average of seven. So, but you can also see in this social network, some people have very extreme large values. Over on the right is the max. So the max of likes per month is 66.92, which is all, that is a lot of likes. Someone's spending a lot of time uh, on social networking here, which is a little bit weird. Um, but number one, this is a simulation. But number two, in reality, it could be a bot or something like that. We never said that this was a clean data set of only humans, but it's very common in real products and services to see some extreme values. So. So that's the data set overview, but let's do another coding exercise and show how that data set came from. Or I mean the first coding exercise, not another coding. But let's do another thing, which is looking at code and running it and not just talking about it. So I'm going to rerun this listing 5.2 that produces those stats because it's kind of a good background. And oh shoot. I forgot to rescale the, the view in my browser. So you're gonna have to, ex I, you can watch me how I set up my preferences for live streaming. Um, I'm going to go to the high contrast setting, change the, there's two font sizes, one for the menus and one for the editor. So I gotta make these both big. And this is, I usually do this before the stream, but now you can see my, my secrets. <laughs> it's not, not a secret, it's just... Sorry to make you watch the setup is what I'm trying to say. All right, so we were gonna do this listing 5-2 data set stats. Uh, that means chapter five, listing number two, and just see how I make that table of statistics that we were just looking at. Let's see, I need to edit my configuration to make one that's uh, run scores. Let me just like copy this and call this one. I, I need to really clean up these configurations, but I'll just call this run stats. And this is gonna be listing two. These are the arguments, chapter five, listing two. And this will load the data set and create those stats. Oh, hey, a message. 
Alejandro Close. You're wondering if you could help me describe to my boss the project of fighting churn looks like. We have lots of data from customers and vents. Not as ordered as yours is, though. Yeah. Well, there's basically um, two main phases to a project. Hmm, I wonder if I should back up and like do a whiteboard to talk about this. I do like answering you know, interesting questions about churn from out of the blue. Uh, so how should I... Well, let me just talk through it. There's the, main, the first main phase is to calculate your customer metrics from your raw data. That's like number one. I'll, I'll put it in the chat, you know. Uh, phase one, it, well, if you don't already have them. Um, because if, you, if your data looks like this and it's raw events, that's not so helpful you need to summarize the events for every customer. So that's basically the phase one. Uh, then phase two is actually analyzing that summary data related to churn. So the first phase is really like a data pipeline preparation phase. And then the second phase is like the churn analysis. So then it's like phase two, churn analysis. Uh, and that kind of, the data prep basically corresponds to chapters uh, three and four in the book. And churn analysis is five and really all the rest of them, depending on how deeply you want to go into it. But just chapter five can be enough for churn analysis. Uh, and then it's actually, the most important phase is phase three, which is do something. <laughs> How's that sound for a description of the project of fighting churn. Uh, the do something is actually, of course, the hardest part in many ways, because that means you need people who are ready to do it. Like you need a marketing department that's gonna send out emails or a customer success department that's gonna do training and support. So there's basically what a project of fighting churn with data looks like at a high level. Let me know if that makes sense or any other questions or comments on that. So this was the code that I was gonna show. Let's see. Uh, it looks like I already started running it, didn't I? If I look at my debugger here, yep. Maybe I made the font too big. Maybe I should make I should do this to make it full screen and we'll get a little bit, squeeze a little bit more in there. Cool, glad that explanation is helpful. Um, it's also like chapter 11 in the book. That's like the last comment is see chapter 11 in the book. Kind of summarizes what I just said or probably says it, I probably just summarized it and in the book it will go more verbose. So in this script, the first thing we do is load the data set and to do that, we first check that the path to the data set is good. So the only thing this expects is that the data set already exists. In this case it does, but so the assertion passes and I read the data in. And in this case, I've got two columns that are like the index, which is the customer ID and the date. Um, and we can now actually take a look at what the data set looks like just to show people who haven't seen a data set before. So this is my index here, which is formed from the customer ID and the date on which the customer renewed or churned. And then this next column is churn is what you would call the outcome or the independent variable that you're trying to predict. We wanna know why people are churning. And then each other column is one of those metrics, like per month, new friend per month, post per month, etc. So, if you've never seen a data set before, now you have. If you've seen one before, that was probably not surprising, but at least you know what this data set looks like. Okay, so here I am first convert the churn data to a float temporarily. In, in memory. And then I use a very handy function, which is the pandas data frame describe, which practically has created the summary that I want for me. Now, if we look at that summary thing, it looks like this. 
This is kind of like the one we were looking at, but you notice it's flipped. I had the name of the metrics on the rows and these summary statistics on the columns. So next I use the transpose function here. Then I add a few additional statistics that I think are really good ones, you know, for analyzing churn. The skew measures how much of a long tail of extreme values you have in a metric. Uh, and the first and 99th percentiles are just good additions to the percentiles, which was already in the describe result. And lastly, I like to add the percentage of non-zero observations. That's also a good one for customer metrics, where very often you have a lot of zero observations. Uh, then I just make the summary and I save it out. Actually, I don't like display it, but we can look. Now there's an output directory, which I've already defined here. And here is the summary stats, which I just created. And if I open it up, it opens in the wrong screen. I like this track. I like this, uh, this, this is on Spotify. This is like the royalty free chill hop or what do they call it? World free chill hop or lo-fi, lo-fi chill out streaming music. So this is the, the summary that we just created. And that was a very simple example of a first uh, listing. I don't think we want to save this. So there, we finally got into some code and well, not the most exciting example. Let's get into some more interesting stuff. That was just to review some old code really before we get on to something new. Okay, today we're going to talk about transformers. Sorry, just clearing my throat there. So, what is a transformer? It's a modular object that represents a data pipeline transformation. Well, that's a lot of buzzwords or a lot of mumbo jumbo. What's a data pipeline? Data pipeline is when you go from your raw data to the final usable data for your analysis. Um, and I have some examples of what are the steps in a data pipeline below. Uh, we'll talk more about them in a second. Um, well, maybe I should just say now, scaling data to scores is one important application. And this whole stream is actually gonna be about that. Also dimension reduction, which means reducing the number of columns in your data, are both some transformations you'll do in a data pipeline. Now sklearn, um, which is scikit-learn, I, I, maybe I should be saying scikit-learn and not sklearn. I'm probably doing like a Python faux pas there by not saying scikit-learn, but anyway. Scikit-learn provides um, some transformers you can use um, and base classes you can extend to make your own. And we're going to look more at the code for a transformer in just a sec. But first, let me talk about scaling data to scores. Um, and I want to do this review because, hey, Matthias. Oh, you mean Matthias who um, were at, from Migo? Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> welcome to the stream. Matthias, I think if this is Matthias from Argentina, who I think, He's actually like um, uh, interviewing at my company. So I just wanna say that joining my stream will in no way bias the interview process, either for better or worse. So you're free to say whatever you want <laughs> on the stream and it won't, it won't affect the, the interviewing review process. <laughs> but welcome to the stream. Um, yeah, what was I saying? Oh, I was gonna do a review of scaling data to scores for people who haven't seen it before. Um, because, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. I was going to say that last stream, I didn't do a good job of this. I realized I just dived right into talking about scoring and I whipped out a, an old presentation. And then I realized afterwards that really wasn't the way I like to do things. I usually do a good introduction for each new topic. So I'm going to try to do a proper introduction now of scaling data to scores and then we'll get into the transformers in a sec. So bear with me. Um, if you already know what scaling data to scores is, this is review. It's also called normalization or standardization or Z scores. Um, but I describe it as like grading on a curve. If you have, if you know that expression, 
Grading on a curve means like you decide, the professor or teacher will decide that an 80 is like a B and then, or a, maybe like more likely a 60 might be a B and then like a, a 75 can be an A, you know, so you rescale everything um, to some pre-assigned, you know, ranking. That was probably a bad description. Let's, we'll look at it in just a sec. So you correct for skew and imbalance by doing this. And it also makes it easy to compare customers by the average uh, or, the, and the, or the mean. Um, this is my great illustration of scoring. And in real data, you have metrics. And like I showed you in the summary, um, you can have the extreme outliers, like this customer who has a thousand posts or something. But most customers only have like zero to like, you know, a hundred posts or likes or whatever it is. So they tend to get all grouped up, um, which can make it harder to analyze. Um, and then a score, uh, well also the mean and standard deviation are unknown over here. Then a score, it's going to have zero mean, one standard deviation, and the data is distributed more evenly across the customers. And that's useful in many contexts. Uh, so it's part of many data pipelines, particularly for regression. So this is where I actually use it in the book, is where we're going to doing a logistic regression where it helps to have, um, you know, rescale data. So this is the score algorithm that I present in the book, and I want to, I hope this will be kind of quick explanation. It's basically taking um, the log of the metric plus one. So you start with your metrics. This is an illustrative bunch of data. I think it's actually the same points that are in this di little diagram. <laughs> you add one to all the metrics. So crucially zero becomes one, and then you take the log. And that then big numbers become small numbers. So the log of a thousand is three, um, and then the log of ten is one. So everything gets scaled like zero, one, two, three, even if the numbers go up into the thousands. Then you take the average and the standard deviation of the transformed data, uh, and then you subtract the average and divide by the standard deviation, which is what typically is done for normalization or z-scoring. So my, score, my scoring algorithm is just a little extension of standard where I add taking the log whenever the metric is skewed. So this is an illustration of if the data is all bunched together in the raw form, and this is how it comes out like more spread out. So now, we'll, hopefully that explanation was not too quick and also not too slow for those of you who already know it. Um, but let's look at the code. Um, and that will make it more clear for anyone who hasn't seen it before. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's always just easier to make new configurations rather than, you know, reusing the old ones. Oh, no, wait. I really shouldn't make a new one because there's a, an old one right here. Oh, God. All right. Sorry. My instinct is just to copy, but I should reuse. Good lesson for developers. So let's see, and here is the listing already with a breakpoint. So this will basically show that the, the code for that operation that I just described. Let's see, okay, first thing we do is, uh, once again, check the data set is there. This is the same data set we were just looking at. Um, and then we, we load it into a data frame. I showed you that, or everyone who was here before already, so I'll just skip that. The first thing I do is make a copy and drop the churn or the outcome column because that's not part of the scoring. The churn is just like, the churn column is just zero, one. Did they churn or not? Now in this code, I actually load the summary stats, um, which is that file that we just produced with the last listing. So there's kind of a method to my badness here by showing you first that uh, code. And then um, we just read it in. And so I can prove it to you by looking at this variable. You select it and then press the calculator button to get the viewer. So you see, this is actually just the same file of statistics that we created a few minutes ago. Um, and I also drop the churn column from here. Now here's the, the key part of this is where I decide which columns are skewed to get that logarithmic rescaling. 
There was a parameter I didn't mention, uh, which is the skew threshold set to four. So typically, I mean, if data is symmetric like a normal distribution, it's got a skew of zero, but below a skew of three is like not that skewed. And roughly, I would say from like three to four is when it's, you know, kind of significantly skewed. But you can get very skewed data. Let's actually look back at our data set. Um, going back, back, back to the stats. So the skews here are all almost all higher than four, 4.6, 10, nine. And you can see it's very skewed because the mean is seven, but the maximum is 380, which is a lot more than seven. Um, and the minimum is not that far from seven, right? See, that's also the key to skew. Skew means it's one way and not the other way. So the minimum is very close to the mean, but the maximum is very far from the mean. So anyway, back into the code, this line checks which columns have um, skew greater than zero. And note that I'm also checking that the minimum, I mean, not skew greater than zero, it checks that the skew is greater than the threshold that I just said a minute ago, and that the, the minimum has to be greater than zero because we're gonna take the log, um, and you can't take a log of a negative number, uh, greater than or equal to zero. So in this case, the skewed columns is a series. Um, it's like a Boolean series where it's showing, hey, look, these are all skewed. Uh, well, these are the ones that are skewed, rather. Uh, you know, there was like one, the account tenure metric wasn't skewed. Okay, now this is the part where it does the logarithm. So this is my one plus logarithm for each metric. And now in these lines, I'm actually replacing the mean and the standard deviation in my little table. The stats is my little table of the stats. And so this replaces them. All right, and that just happens in a loop. And I can skip out of the loop by putting another breakpoint there. And now this is the part where we subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And then that's it. So now that's really completed the algorithm uh, for doing the, the, the scoring or normalization using the logarithmic transform for highly skewed variables. Um, cool, so then this is uh, saving results to score save path. Uh, and so that just basically resaves the data. I can show you the score data real quick if you've never uh, seen this. Let's see, here I should select the scores and then use evaluate and view the data frame. And now what you see here is before in the original data, the values were like real numbers. It was like how many ad views per month did the person have? And it was a number like zero, one, two, 10, 50. And now it's a real value um, and they're all small numbers. They're all kind of, you can see, they all kind of range from like minus two to like a few higher, you know? So they're all kind of clustered around zero. Um, and they're, so it looks quite different, a score data set than a regular data set. Cool, all right. So that kind of wraps up this listing, which was 5.3, the metric scores. Now. What about transformers? That was kind of the review of the scoring algorithm. That was me, this is me catching up the slides. So we've now reviewed what metric scores look like. And next we can look at how an sklearn transformer works and how it encapsulates that logic. Because what I just did was a bunch of code. It was like an algorithm that you run and you can run that and it'll, ter it'll convert data to scores. But it's not, um, it's not a convenient package for doing that. Um, it, 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 how do you rerun the same algorithm again is like a key question. You want to basically create the transformation and then save it. Right now, to rerun that transformation on new data, you need to have those stats. Remember, it, it had to load the stat file. 
And so that is why the transformer pattern is more modular, meaning it's like a package, because the transformer pattern includes the data that makes the transformation reusable. Right now, to run that, my transformation, you need both the code and the saved data in a file. Um, and this pattern allows you to save the transformation with the data embedded in it. So this is the pattern. You make a class, my transformer, and you descend from these two classes here. You get an init method, a fit function, um, and then a transform function. And the fit function is where it determines those parameters for reuse. And then transform is how it can transform any data set. So now we're going to look at that um, scoring algorithm in a new form, which is in the transformer. And this is actually now what I did last week. Um, so if you saw it last week, I'm sorry, I'm going to show you the same transformer again, but we will do a new transformer soon. Um, let's see. So let's go to this one. And I'm pretty sure I already made a transformer here. It's like run, oh God, see this is, I can't find anything is the problem. So this is run score transformer is the new one. Whoops, let me, I got too much stuff open here. Oh, there it is. This says five, five score transformer. Looks like I got the, the number wrong. But I'm going to, where does it start? This is actually the entry point for the score transformer. But maybe we should, let me give you, let me, let's look at it first. I think that's actually a good idea. I'm gonna collapse all these functions. So you can see basically in this file, yes, this is good. Let me start at a high level. In this file, we have a function, which is basically the entry point that the, my code will call into. And this is actually the class that does the transformation. So this class has those methods that we would, I just said, are the standard part of the pattern. Um, I called it the log skew normalizing transformer. Maybe that's like too long a name. You know what, I think I'm actually gonna change that. Let's call this, I'm gonna refactor this. Let's call it the log skew normalizer. I think that is much less of a mouthful. Do a little refactor here. And that'll rename the class here and in the code that calls it. So this, we'll step through these methods in just a moment, but I wanted to kind of show you this at a high level. Um, that skew threshold that we were talking about before becomes one of the parameters in the constructor. And so now let's, I'll, I'll step through, I'll step through the code. That's the plan. Okay, like most of this code starts out by checking that the data set is really there and loading it. Okay, and now I create the transformer here just by, well, you create it like an object and I pass in the skew threshold. And I'll also go in here, we'll step through this now and look at what's happening here. Mostly it's just uh, setting the skew threshold and also um, setting a bunch, of, a bunch of variables to none, just to prepare. There's also an out column, which is the outcome column is churn. And I added that to make this transformer useful for, you know, other data sets. Because um, my data set assumes there's an is churn column, but other data sets might not. All right, so I stepped out of the, uh, the constructor right there, and now we're back in the calling function. Now the churn data is that data frame we looked at before. You can actually see down here. It's actually only 1,592 rows because I made a small data set in my own database just to speed up you know, some stuff during the demo. <laughs> um, a real data set for this might be like, I think from the book you'll get like a 30,000 row data set. All right, now we call the fit function of the transformer. Now some of this code is gonna look familiar from when we were looking at the score uh, function before. In fact, all of this code, if you watched me do the score function previously, all this code should look kind of familiar. Well, 
Anyway, let me get moving. So we do have an outcome column and we do want to drop it just because it's not part of the measurement that we're gonna do. So I just, <clears throat> excuse me, rename it data to measure and I drop the outcome column, which was is churn. Now next, I check what are the columns and this is actually literally just making a list of the names of the columns. Um, and that's just handy to have for later. And if you haven't seen that trick, this is how I got the names of the columns from my other data frame by calling, by setting it to the data to measure columns values. You know what? I think this is probably bad. I think I need to make a copy of that. I'm actually thinking about this code right now because this is actually setting it to the reference in the data frame. That's probably bad. I'm gonna work on that in a minute. Uh, still fixing bugs. This is new code I wrote last week and very often when you write some code and then you step away from it for a while, you see problems. But if you're out there on the chat, let me know if you think I'm right. I think I need to make a copy here or I'm leaving a reference to a, a, a member of this data frame, which is, doesn't really seem like a good idea. Might not do any harm because this data frame was a copy here but it'll keep this, the, this data frame in existence via the reference. So I think it's a kind of memory leak. Anyway, so the next thing this data, this does is it measures these statistics, the mins, the means, the standard deviations, and the skews. Now I have to do this in my transformer class because they were part of the algorithm, but previous in the code I showed earlier, I reloaded them from the stats file, which was kind of like a cheat. In a, or, I don't know, it's using the fact that I already done it. So now you can see here in the self, uh, in the, which is the object, I can look at the means and see these are the mean values of all the metrics, just like we saw before, stored in, in a named series um, by using the, these functions of the pandas data frame. Now I'm also checking what are the skewed columns, and this looks familiar from the previous code. Also, if you saw me do it, let's look at that one. The skewed columns, we can see down here. Now this one is a named Boolean series. Um, so unfriend per month, new friend per month, and account tenure were not skewed, not heavily skewed in this data set. And now in this one line or here, I reduce it to only the skewed columns. So now it's a Boolean series of only the true values. Um, I can like show you that by, well, maybe, no. <laughs> if I can select this whole self skewed columns, now you can see it becomes only, only the ones that are skewed are actually stored in that variable. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. So now I've got the skewed columns. And now the last thing I have to do is find out the means of the log transformed skewed columns. Um, so this is me dropping the outcome column if necessary. And now in this copy of the original data set, I'm going to actually do the log transform like I showed you in the original scoring algorithm. And I'm gonna reset the means and the standard deviations for the skewed columns to the mean and the standard deviation of the, the, you know, the log scale. So that's kind of, this is actually running all the prep of the previous scoring algorithm, but none of the actual transformation on the data. So that's what we're doing here. And I, now I'll just step out of this. So now I've, I've fit the transformer. It was basically just doing all those measurements, but it hasn't done any transforming yet, has it? So, Let's see. Next, we'll actually do a transform call. And here, we actually copy the data as well. Um, and this is the same trick as before, dropping the is churn column, because we're not going to um, you know, uh, transform that one. We're gonna put it back on at the end, as you'll see. So the next thing I do is that I, remember I made this self.columns uh, variable, the one that I had the suspected memory leak, it lists all the columns. And now the next thing I do is I make sure that all of the columns uh, in the columns list are represented in the data S. 
because if they're not, then we have a problem. The next thing we do is I select, well, I possibly select, but I reorder the matrix, the data frame S to the same order as the saved columns. And this is just a, to cover in case the new data set has a different order. Um, unlikely if you're using the same code, but you know, these things happen. So you gotta be careful. Uh, let's see. So I have found that all my columns are there and now I've reordered it. Now I'm actually gonna do the transformation of the skewed column by looping over uh, the skewed column list and doing one plus the log. And rather than iterating around that again and again, I'll go to the next breakpoint where I do um, the means and the standard deviations. Uh, subtract the means and divide by the standard deviations. I shouldn't say do the means and standard deviations because if you haven't seen this algorithm before, it's important to realize that you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And that's how you get the result to be mean zero uh, and standard deviation one. You know, I didn't really explain that when I went through the algorithm before, so my bad on that. But so now we have the, 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 the scale data in S, and so we can look at this one here, and you can see like before, these are the small numbers centered around zero, mean zero, standard deviation one, representing the original metrics. Now the original algorithm actually saved it, so that's why I put that here. So we still resave the scores. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Now in this code, whoops, I also am going to save the transformer. Now that's like another trick. We want to be able to reuse this transformer later. So here I use something called joblib.dump, which I'm actually not even sure why I don't use pickle, but I read, um, a post saying that you should use joblib to save uh, these transformers. I don't know if anyone on the chat knows anything about that, but I always knew pickle for dumping Python objects, but for some reason, it seems that with transformers, the approved method is to use joblib dump. So that's what happens here. Uh, and that's just an error that the debugger prints out, so don't mind that. <laughs> Your code will, if you run it, will really run like this, saving the transformer to this path. And we can look in that path on my local and see here, I've saved the transformer as a pickle. It's a small object, 7K. And I've actually saved the scores uh, in this file. So that demonstrates um, the first score transformer. And now we can go on to something new and do a more advanced version. Um, let's talk about um, fat tail scoring. Um, this was the chapter three score formula for skewed metrics. We did this transformation M equals the, the logarithm M prime, I should say, equals the logarithm of one plus M and then we subtracted the mean of M prime. That's what this notation means. Mu usually represents the mean, and then we divided by the standard deviation represented by sigma. But this doesn't work for negative metrics. Um, and so now this is what I call a real data ninja move. That's why I have my data ninja. If you're wondering what this black blob is here, that's my cheap attempt to make a data ninja joke. <laughs> Um, but so what was I saying? Yeah. So this is a real data ninja move. It's a scoring algorithm that works well for negative values with negative, uh, values that are extreme in your data set. And to do this, we actually need to look at a slightly different data set. So let me run through that real quick. Um, let me rerun some scores. I, there's a more advanced version of the data set in the book, and I'm going to show you how to rerun the statistics on the more advanced data set. Um, and to do that, so I want to show you a, a data set which has negative values where we would want to do scoring. Um, and I'm going to check, I have to dig into my configuration to remember the right listing here. These are the configurations for all, for what you can run with the, the listing runner from the book. Um, 
So here I want to run data set stats and under this, it's basically organized by chapter and then listing. Under data set stats, I have these versions. So I actually want to run version one because it'll use data set two. This is all from the book. There's data set one, which is your basic data set, and then data set two is more advanced. So I'm going to change the version number in the stat program to run on data set two. God, if I can find it again. Uh, actually, let me, actually, I need to edit configurations. And this is the stat. So basically, I just have to go here and do version two. And this will be the stats for the, what I call the advanced data set. And, I'll, and then, we, then I'll show it to you. Um, let's see, I think I still had a breakpoint in the stats function. But let's, we'll just look. So here I'm, I'm, I'm loading this data. Oh, you might hear my dog in the background. <laughs> yep, there's my dog. Do you hear him? I, someone must be at the door. Well, let's see. Not my problem now. So this is the new data set, and let's take a look at it. <laughs> this, is, this is a weird song. <laughs> What is it? Quit asking me for sandwiches. Hmm, nice chill hop jazz though. So this data set, we have more metrics here. If I keep going. Wait a second, this is the wrong data set. This is why I'm checking, what the heck? I thought I ran version two, data set two. Whoops, all right, wrong data set, wrong data set. Let me go back to the configuration. Oh no, it's supposed to be version one is data set two. This was, version two was for the, the scores that I actually saved. Okay, mistake, mistake, rerun, rerun, redo. Let's go back here and this should be version one. So version zero, I guess, is like the original one. All right, let me show you the real data set that I wanted to show you now. All right. The right data set is here. So this data set has more metrics. Uh, so it has the original ones like like per month, new friend per month. But if I keep going over, um, we have these other ones which have names like add view per post, reply per message, like per post. So these are dividing one metric by the other. Ooh, a question from Tarek CS. One question about pre-processing and classification. In the case of categorical features with high cardinality, how do you treat that feature? That feature is important for the model. Well, it really depends. First question I would say is, are all the categories important for the feature? Um, I usually like to have my, there's two different ways you can handle high cardinality. Now we're going to more of an advanced subject for those of you who are already data scientists. Tarex is, uh, oh, so all of them are important for the model. Well, first of all, I would say that in my experience, that's rare <laughs> because if you have so many categories and they're mutually exclusive, it's inevitable that you have categories that only apply to very small fractions of your data. So it's very unusual, I would say, to have so many categories and have them all significant because by it's given that every category can only apply to less than 1% of your data on average. On average, they're gonna to apply to 0.2% of your data. So in general, a category, the fewer examples that it applies for, it's just harder and harder for it to be significant. Now in, the, in that case, if they really are all significant, you should use cat boost, basically. And that's an, an algorithm that's really designed for high cat, hard cardinality categories. Um, the operators of transactions in fraud. Yeah, I guess so. If you really, if, I don't know, if you're saying is the operators, are, so every column is an operator. Hmm, I guess so. So anyway, my knowledge on that is to use cat boost, um, which is an algorithm that's designed to, you know, have high cardinality of categories and still, you know, work well. In the, in the more normal case where many of your categories are not so important, which is really what you usually have, 
Um, you're going to do something like group your categories together into broader categories. Like if you have, let's say you have county or a very local data where it's like a small town, basically you could group them together into regions. That's like the more common case is where you have very many categories, but there's actually a logical structure or grouping that you can impose on them. And that actually leads to more interpretable results. And that may even, you know, work as well in the case where, you know, you're saying that you can't, you know, everyone is important. By grouping them, you're not actually not dropping them. If you have some logical, you need more information about your problem to do the grouping, though. Um, so, anyway, so there's a little discussion of what, of what you can do with a large number of categories. Um, there are probably other good tricks for this, too. But, yeah. Probably, anyway, we're assuming a lower number. In fact, we're assuming no categories. If you look at this data, there are no categories here. So that was all about a category problem. This is a case where what I wanted to talk about was metrics with negative values. And this is an example, which is a percent change metric, if you define it, where a percent change can be either positive or negative. Um, percent changes can, all, can be negative. And remember I said that that causes a problem. So this is running through the stats. Um, now I'm just gonna kind of like run through this because I don't think it was that interesting. Uh, this is, I was just gonna show you the new data set was actually the first plan. So I showed you that it has many new columns. And let's actually go to um, look at the summary stats. So these are the stats that you would see if you ran stats on that data set. And the key thing to note is when we get down to this dislike, uh, or no, it's percent change. Where is it? New friend percent change. The minimum is negative one, and there are negative values in here for people who have negative percent changes. Are there any other percent changes? Maybe that's the only one. I didn't make too many examples because I try to keep this data set, you know, short and sweet, you know, for learning in the book. Uh, so it has negatives, and it's also like kind of skewed as well. It's actually not too skewed in this one. Hmm, that's interesting. Normally, it's kind of skewed. probably because I made a small data set, but I can lower the threshold, you know, when we do the next example. So this is an illustration where you can have a metric which can have some extreme values. This one is actually not that extreme, it even seems like. Well, the highest value is nine, and the average is, is close to, well, zero. So it is kind of skewed, it's not the worst. So let's see, so what were we doing? Back to this scoring formula. This is the whole point, I was just did that whole diversion to talk about why would you want a scoring formula that can handle negative values? So I wanted to make a, a data set that actually had a negative value. Because as you see in like my original basic data set, it's only um, positive values, because it's all based on counts and ratios. So what happens if you have negative values, you use this formula, which is actually like a hyperbolic tangent formula, or I'm actually forgetting exactly. I don't know if we have any math buffs out there who remember. This is some kind of like hyperbolic sine or cosine f formula, seriously. But I just call it the fat tail scoring formula because you can use it uh, to achieve the same result of like pulling in extreme values, uh, even if there are negative values mixed in. So this is it here. Um, you take the square root of the number squared plus one, and that means that if it had a negative value, this number will be slightly greater than m here. So it, the, this result will always be positive. And then if you have a positive value, the square root of m squared plus one will be even bigger, and it just means that everything gets shifted to be positive, but at the same time, it, it's like the, it's taking the logarithm, so it takes very extreme numbers and pulls them in to be, you know, small numbers. Um, so that is the what I call the fat tail scoring formula, 
And now what I want to do is do um, some new coding, which is what I like to do in these streams, which is to make a Fat Tails normalizer uh, transformer, which I previously have not had. So I'm just basically adding transformers to the code from my book now. I guess I didn't back up and explain. I didn't do transformers when I wrote the book because, well, it's a long story. When I worked at Zora, I was actually using R to on all the dozens of companies that I did churn analysis at Zora, we were using R. So I didn't all do all this in Python, but of course the same concepts apply in any language. Then when I wrote the book, I, I had to write it in Python. Well, I decided to write in Python because Python's more popular. And it was also a good learning experience for me. It improved my Python programming a lot. But I didn't have time to learn transformers and do transformers um, before I wrote the book. So my book was kind of like a minimum viable product, if you know what I mean, from the SaaS or the software industry. A minimum viable product means just good enough to sell, but maybe not, you know, you can still improve it. So this is me improving the code from my book by adding transformers um, where in the book there were none. So let me get back to the hacking. So I had an old Fat Tails scoring algorithm. Let's find that one. I won't run it for you because you're probably bored of me running the same crap again and, and again. Let's see. So I had Fat Tails scores was the old uh, code that I had, which looks, it's kind of similar to the first scoring algorithm that you saw, but it is, um, it includes not just working on uh, skewed columns, it also works on fat uh, tailed columns. And here I just find fat tailed as, you know, skewed plus the minimum negative less than zero, which is actually not a very good definition. I really should have used like that the kurtosis, uh, is, which is a better measure of being fat tailed is greater than some threshold. Um, so maybe I should add that. I can think about that while we're doing this. But so now I'm gonna try to do the live coding. I'm gonna have the last sip of my coffee. This is my energy for, you know, live coding. And so what I want to do is go back to chapter seven and basically supplement it, make a new listing. It'll be 710, which will be a Fat Tails uh, normalizing transformer. So let's see. What should my first step be? Like any good programmer, my first step should probably be to copy another listing um, and modify it. Because since I got one script with a transformer working last week, the most logical thing to do is, well, first I was gonna fix it actually. Remember, I had my bug. Hmm. That's another good one to remember. What was my bug? It was a memory leak that this should be copy, I don't know, dot deep, whoops, deep copy um, that. So I'm not keeping a reference to the original um, data frame. That was my first fix in this code. So it's good to fix before I reuse. How's that for a motto for a coder? So now I'm going to resave this I'm going to resave it into a different chapter. Oops, is this working? Let's see, here we go. Because my fat tails thing is in chapter seven. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to call this, I said it was going to be what, 710. And this is going to be, I guess, fat tails transformer. And also I should say fat tails is a term usually popular on Wall Street and in finance. And you say a distribution is fat-tailed if it has a lot of extreme values in both directions. It actually sounds kind of bad and unpolitically correct, but it's not making, it's not body shaming or anything like that. It's distribution shaming. And I don't think, you know, distribution shaming is really a thing. So 
I don't know. So I'm gonna rename this my Fat Tails Transformer, uh, and I will add it to Git. And I'll call this, uh, well, I guess I'll make it, well, actually rather than just editing it like that, I should be smart and I should refactor. This is good to use my old one because a lot of it is gonna be the same. So I'll refactor this to Fat Tails Normalizer. And let's see. Now I'm gonna go over my old algorithm and decide how I need to change it. Because remember, what I'm doing is practically the same. I still need all of these things, the means, the means, standard of skews. I think I actually want to include a better definition for fat tails. Um, and I seem to have some extra spaces there. So I'm gonna do a self dot kurtosis. Ooh, is that even a word? And this is going to be data to measure dot. How do you get the, the Kurt? I guess so. Let's actually, I'm actually gonna have to look up, you know, Pandas data frame. This is, you know, how people really program, right? With, with uh, Stack Overflow and Google. <laughs> so here I'm gonna do Pandas data frame, how to measure kurtosis. Okay, it has a method. Curso kurtosis, there you go. <laughs> I didn't even have to get to Stack Overflow for that one. So it's actually this one. And I'm actually not sure if this is the, <laughs> the plural of, I'm just gonna abbreviate it as Kurtz. Um, so now given the algorithm that we had before, let's see. We should also make, now we should basically have another thing, self dot uh, fat tail columns equals self dot curts greater than, well, I don't have a curt threshold yet, but I guess I should. So I'm gonna actually just add that here this is me kind of improving the code from what I had in the original version. This will be my Kurt. I didn't actually use the Kurt, Kurtosis. Equals, God, I can't even remember what is like a realistic threshold for a high Kurtosis. Uh, let's, again, let's say Kurtosis of, yeah, let's check what's the kurtosis of normal distribution. It's three. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yes, kurtosis of a normal distribution is three. Oh yeah, and we can look at these cool pictures here. Whoops, that was not what I wanted. What I wanted to do was go to the Wikipedia article. And we can review what the kurtosis is for anyone who's still interested out there. Hmm, where's the pictures? Hmm. Boy, they don't even really look that different when you look at these pictures. What else we got here? Hmm. You know, this is not that informative. I think I'm gonna get back to coding. <laughs> People are like dropping off my stream like flies right now. Too much in the kurtosis. So I'm gonna use a curt thresh of say also four. Um, and right, so now we will have, I uh, kind of wanted to move this up to, I don't know why there's so much space at the end of every column here. Something weird happened. I am like insert mode, because this is like going crazy. Whoa, what is happening? I'm seeing doubles. This is actually going really badly. I've never really had a weird... Uh... Wow, I seem to be in like insert mode or something. Uh, 
I'm gonna actually restart this right now. I hope this is, I'm, I'm actually having like a little technical difficulty because I've gotten into some weird mode in, in my uh, code editor. Let me restart that and see if I can get some better luck on that. Before I finish the Fat Tails uh, Transformer. Man, what the hell was going on with this thing? Maybe it's time to upgrade. So this was what I was trying to do. Yes, all right, I don't know what the hell happened. That never happened to me before. Um, ooh, I think I lost my out column equals out call, okay. And self dot curt thresh equals the kurtosis threshold. All right, let's see. So now I will pass in a kurtosis threshold, measure the kurtosis, and let's see, the fat tail columns self dot k greater than, yep. And I guess I should do, it should also not be the skewed columns, I think. Although, hmm. I mean, if it's skewed, then you know it doesn't have, um, it probably doesn't have a high kurtosis, but I'll say, all, and I, I think I want this to be not self.skewed columns, but I'll have to like, you know, double check this myself. How do you negate, I think, oh yeah, it's actually tilde in this Python language, right? Let's see. All right, I think this is correct. Okay, so now what's the next step? I think it's actually just to go down here and add the new um, transformation. Although I also wanna use this little bit of logic so that the These columns are actually only the true ones, right? So I'm basically do the same logic for the skewed columns and the fat tailed columns. Now, all I need to do down here is do a similar logic for the fat tail columns, but now I want to do, well, let's go back to my formula. It was in the, in the slide deck. It's supposed to be the log of the metric plus the square root of the metric plus one. Um, let's see, although actually, like any good programmer, I should actually copy paste my old ones. Let's see. I must have this in my old listing, seven five. Let's see, oh yeah, it's up here in this transform. I, I made a separate helper function to do this before. Hey, Ken Bafu. Yeah, well, you're not that late because I'm actually still just going on some coding. I'm working on writing a transformer to wrap um, what I call the fat tail scoring algorithm which I was kind of just explaining on this slide. Um, and I also want to stress that fat tail scoring is not like a put down, it's not body shaming. Um, although maybe we should find a new name for fat tails because it is one of those terms where you think it's not that offensive because you're just talking about that, the, the tails of a data distribution. But hey, maybe it offends someone, who knows? Don't want to be offensive, but I wanted to get, so this expression, it's just easier for me to copy paste it than to re-remember <laughs> how to use it. And I'm going to put it into my transformer class um, here. 
But now I want this to be, okay, instead of data, I've got S. It's like my new. And this is gonna be the transformation for the columns that have those extreme values. So it's square root of the column squared plus adding one to every value. Um, and then also adding the metric here. Let me just see, is that the right formula? Yep, looks pretty good. Okay, now the problem is I actually don't even know what the kurtosis is for my data set. So you know what, let's actually go back and I'm gonna like update, I wanna update my stats listing, data set stats, cause now I wanna get the kurtosis. I, I actually never, go, I didn't put this in the book act, honestly because I didn't want to burden people with, you know, too much uh, statistics in the book. I was trying to keep it light in case you, you know, those of you who don't know. I want to try running this one again. I'm just going to like run it and then we'll look and see what are the, the kurtosis for these metrics. I'm not actually sure anything here even has an extreme kurtosis, but let's find out. I think I need to close up. Oh, I guess I, I had it closed already. Here's the new summary stats. I should have just added kurtosis to it if that change worked. Actually, it looks like it either it didn't work or I didn't really rerun it. All right, so, oh, I know what's wrong. I have a bug. If you, whoops, back to the code. If you remember, I also reorder the column here. So here I need to add this to my reordering, or I won't see it in the final file. That was effectively dropping the new column that I just worked so hard to add. All right, so that fixes the bug. And now I will see, hopefully, the kurtosis in my summary stats. Wow, many of these are, are actually quite high. This, this is interesting. Well, it's expected that they're high because these are very non-normal distributions. Let's just like quickly format this to a number and we'll see what was the kurtosis of the metrics in this data set. Hmm, wow. So the most extreme, wow, was 342. And it's also quite skewed. So you can actually see that skew and kurtosis are often go hand in hand. Um, they do seem to be largely affecting the same metrics in this data set. I guess that's another reason I didn't include it in the first version. But it's a more reliable way. Um, so we can see also for that new friend percent change, um, its skew wasn't that high three would not be considered a very high skew, but its kurtosis is clearly, you know, much greater, you know, than the normal kurtosis. So yeah, the normal kurtosis being three. So anyway, so I, it's good to note, I'm going to go back to our um, transformer that I was working on. So here's the transformer. So I was just noting what should be my default for a kurtosis threshold. I guess if the normal kurtosis is three, I actually think I should use something like maybe seven as like a cutoff for what's a high kurtosis, you know, variable. So that'll be our kurtosis threshold. All right, I think this new listing is actually ready to run. Because, wait, is this the right one? Yeah. Uh, actually, not quite ready. I have to update the trans... This is the fit method. Oh yeah, I also have to do this part. Whoops, wouldn't want to forget that. This has to be in fat tail columns. And now I have to use the right transformation, which I already put here, um, let's 
see. Uh, ask Kong, I think. This is what I have to do right. So I actually apply the transformation and then retake the mean and the standard deviation as part of the object setup. So I should really maybe put some comments in this code. But anyway, maybe another day. I don't do a lot of comments in the code from the book because the problem is when the code shows up in the book, the book is the comment and you don't want to comment in the code because then it's like it takes up space on the page. Um, so let's see. All right, now I think I might really be ready to run this. So I'll rename this one. I have to name it uh, Fat Tails Transformer. Um, and this should really be it. So the next thing I need to do is make my configuration. I'll put a breakpoint here. So when we run it, um, it'll stop there. Let me go in there and find, uh, well, I need to go back to my configuration. That's what I need to do. So in chapter seven, let's see, we have a default, mm, no default. Basically, I have to go in here and enter listing 10 and then put the correct name in. Uh, and then I have to put in um, the right parameters. And here I'm just going to copy these as usual to make it easy. Now the name has to be my new function. And the data set has to be data set two, or there's no point in using the fat tails uh, thing because data set one didn't really have anything like that. All right, so I need to get this name. Copy pasting it to avoid typos. And okay, that's the configuration you have to make in the JSON if you add a new listing to the book. You'll probably never add a new listing to the book yourself, but I have to go through this to make it easy for other people to run the stuff. So now I have to go in here and make a new configuration in PyCharm. And here I'll duplicate this one and call it the Fat Tails Transformer. I don't even know why I put run in all these, right? They're all running something. Now this has to be chapter seven, listing 10. All right, I think I'm now ready to test the new listing. Shall we give it a whirl? Whoops. All right, first bug. What is it saying? Probably I, I, I set something wrong. Um, do, 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 do. Running time, blah, blah, blah. What do I have? Python based exception. Got an unexpected keyword argument. Ooh, okay. I think that's a, pro a bug in my configuration. Ah, I see the problem. There's a default parameter for this chapter. There are these which is getting passed in. So what I think that means is I just need to go in here and just put in another parameter to absorb the unexpected arguments because there, you know, <clears throat> it'll just be, you know, uh, yeah, it'll just be ignored now. So let's try that. Star star KWR stands for uh, unknown keyword arguments can come in there. Let's see if this works now. All right, there we go. So that fixed that little bug with the other arguments from the chapter. Let's make sure it's a data set path. Okay, it is a data set path. Uh, and we load the data set as usual. Um, not that many examples in this one, but now let's go into the new fat tails normalizer. And now it has both a skew threshold and a kurtosis threshold and an outcome column. 
Oh, wait, another bug, actually. I should. Well, it's not exactly a bug, but it's a stylistic point that here I assign this variable without actually having declared it. Let me go back and fix that because I'm still developing here. So I hope you don't mind if I'm just like, you know, <laughs> stopping the code midway through, but hey, this is live coding. Just want to do the right thing. All right, and then we'll get back to debugging it. And I think we, we're done debugging the constructor. So I will just step over the constructor here. So the constructor now works. Now I'll step into the fit method. And as before, well, if you saw me doing this before, maybe I should not assume that you've seen me doing this before because I, I know a bunch of people dropped off and then came back onto the stream. But anyway, uh, let's see. So we drop the outcome column because we're not scaling that one. Um, and then I make a list of what the columns are. Um, and in this case, the columns is that longer list of, uh, of metrics. Yep, just making sure I got the right data set here. And now I'm doing a deep copy of the columns so that I'm not keeping a memory leak by pointing to the data frame um, column header. All right, so now I do all these measurements, including my kurtosis. Ooh, that's a gnarly word to say. And we'll see which of these are high kurtosis, like we saw before. And this measures the skewed column. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this one does the fat tailed columns. This little bit of code, I'm not quite sure. I'm pretty sure that's the, the right expression, but let's see what my result is. I think this should only show me that the percent change metric counts as fat tailed. Let's see. False, false, false. Oh wait, all false. Now something's really wrong. Unfriend per new friend. Why? New friend percent change also. So I think something's wrong. Hmm. Because, let's look at these again. See, uh, new friend percent change has a kurtosis of 17. So it is quite high. Do I have a bug here? Let's like just try this one. Maybe it came up as skewed. So this looks right. Uh, all the right ones came up as having high kurtosis. But what are the skewed columns? I thought new friend percent change shouldn't have a, a, a it shouldn't be a skewed column. What the heck? This is. Oh, I see the bug. I think I, I already reduced the skewed columns and it's, it's reusing it. All right, what I need to do here, stopping the program, stop the program, bug fix, bug fix. What I need to do here is first use it to find out what are the fat tailed columns and then I can prune it to only the true values. All right, let's actually put a breakpoint here and see if this worked now. All right, live, de live debugging here. This is what live coding is all about. Making some mistakes. Let's get to my next breakpoint by hitting the play button here. So now my skewed columns is going to be all of the columns. Uh, which IDE do I use? I'm using PyCharm, which is, I believe, what's the company? IntelliJ or something? All right, so these are the skewed columns. And now, for the fat tail columns, I should see at least one example. I had to put one example in the book to demonstrate this technique. Oh, there we go. Huh. Now a few of them appear to be huh, considered fat-tailed. 
Hmm. Due to high kurtosis. Okay. Maybe I should use a higher kurtosis threshold, but I can think about that later. All right, so anyway, now I have, you know, the right transforms in. And now I reduce the skewed columns in the fat-tailed column list to just the ones that are skewed and fat-tailed. And they should be mutually exclusive. Yeah, these are basically the first chapter uh, metrics, are mostly the skewed ones. And now the fat-tail columns. Maybe I should call them long-tail columns. It's just these. Hmm. I'll think about raising the kurtosis threshold. Okay, anyway, the next stage here is to do the transforms. So first for the skewed columns, it's gonna loop over. Um, let's see, show some more code. It's gonna loop over and do the logarithmic transform and then replace the means and standard deviations for those columns. Let's actually put a breakpoint here. Skip that part. Not that this part is that much more exciting. Good tunes though. So, Ken Pafu, what IDE do you use? I guess the other main choice nowadays is VS Code. Uh, but I like independent software. I don't, so I kind of stay away from the Microsoft products for independent software. So there's only three fat-tailed columns, so I'll just go through here. This is applying that hyperbolic uh, transformation. Yep, you use VS Code, haha. -ha. <laughs> but you also code in JS, oh, okay, cool. So I guess that's the big thing for uh, JavaScript. Cool, well, data science is fun. And there's a ton of data science in the world that needs to be done nowadays. <clears throat> okay, now I've successfully fit the transformer. Now I'm gonna try the transform function. So we'll step into it. Um, we copy the data drop the outcome column, check that all the columns uh, in my previous data that I used for fitting are in the new one. And then I reorder the columns, perhaps unnecessary, but just to be safe. Now for the skewed columns, it's gonna do this um, you know, log transform, post per month, add view per month. There's like eight of these, I'm just clicking through them this time. All right, come on. Come on, this is almost done. Finally, now the fat tail columns, of which there should be three, and now they get this uh, transformation. Let's see, you can't see the column name anymore. It's showing up up here, call. New friend, days since new friend, all right. And then lastly, we resubtract the, the means and divide by the standard deviations. And if there is an outcome column, which would be the churn uh, outcome indicator in this case, we reattach it here at the end. So that looks like it's it. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the transformer. Now I also, um, whoops, found another bug. Well, I saved the scores, no problem there, because these are still scores. The problem is my bug here that I want to um, save that transformer. And I don't want to use the name as my other one. So I'm going to rename, I'm going to save this as, I'll just say like fat tail. I'm really thinking about renaming everything to long tail. But the thing is fat tail has the connotate in the literature has a connotation of both directions. So I'm stuck with a, 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 a indecision here where, you know, kind of an old terminology in the literature is now sounding like kind of old fashioned. So I still call, dis what's another name for distributions with long tails other than fat tails? It could be wide tails. Yeah, thanks Ken Pafu. I'm stuck, but I just want everyone to know this is not body shaming. This is distribution describing. Uh, so, all right, so that, I just killed my, my running code to fix it. And now I think I'll just run it through 
I'm just gonna run the whole thing through now. And then I'll look at my outcome. So it says it saved my scale data to this scores data set, and it saved my transformer uh, in this pickle. Can look at my output directory. And so here's my pickled transformer. Hey, it's bigger than the last one. So you remember the first one was only seven kilobytes. Now it is 12 kilobytes. So you can tell it's different. Why is it different? Probably because there's more metrics. I took one more statistic. I saved one more statistics. That's probably just a couple of bytes, but then there's more metrics. So I guess all that adds up. It's hard to understand how a few strings and a few floats can add up to 5K, but <laughs> the mysteries of pickling. So you can't open the pickle. We can't open the scores. If you want to see what the scores look like. The scores now look like, uh, well, they look like normalized variables. They're all small numbers uh, centered around zero. Zero mean one standard deviation. So now they all have negative values, but the negative value has a different meaning. Now the negative value means it's below the mean. It doesn't mean that it's actually negative. So yeah, that's pretty much it. That is the score transformer. And if we want to do something else interesting, I think we can look at the stats of the transformed data. Let's just do that because we were just looking at the versions of the metric stats listing. And if I look here, I can find the one for data set two scores. Holy crap, if it's even there. Wow, maybe there isn't even one for data set two scores. Group score. Well, I can always add one. Let's just go in here and I will add a version 11. And this can be data set two underscore scores. So now when I go back to the conf uh, this configuration and I want to run stats, I'll run version 11. And this is going to run the statistics code on the scores that I just saved. So now we're going to see what are the data set statistics after you convert it to scores. Um, and since I already did this listing earlier in the stream, I'm just going to run it. <laughs> and let's look at those summary stats and we'll see what we have done. I mean, if anyone wants me to step through that listing again, um, I'd be happy to, anyone who just joined the stream. But I think it's a pretty basic listing. So this is the summary stats page, or I always show these things in Microsoft Excel because it's just pretty, pretty convenient. So now, what is going on here? In, in contrast to the original data, which I, I think I still had open, now the mean is always these like really small numbers. Hmm, I wonder if something's wrong actually. Because those are not zero. Hmm, I think there might be a problem, but let's think about it. And these standard deviations are not zero either. What happened here? Do I have more debugging to do? Because now it looks like this didn't work, to be blunt. Because these still have a very high kurtosis. And they're still skewed and they don't have... All right, what happened here? Did anyone see my bug? Or was there a bug? I'm like trying to, I feel like there is a bug. Uh, because this is not what I expect. I, what I'm seeing here is that the three one that got, the three metrics that got the, this transform with the, the hyperbolic tangent thing, they didn't correctly get zero mean and one standard deviation. So I do believe that something went wrong. All right, did you see my bug? What is my bug? What is the bug? What is the bug? It's that the means and standard deviations don't seem right. But 
but this looks right here. Does anyone out there see what I'm doing wrong? Because here I do the transformation and then I take the mean and standard deviation for that, for that one. I verified that this was just a list of those three metrics and that this was the skewed columns. I actually am really not getting this now. Because uh, I fit them on the same data that I transformed afterwards, didn't I? Uh, I'm not seeing it, but I think something's wrong here because it, it just seems like it didn't work. Like if this worked, then the mean and standard deviation of the fat tailed columns should also be one. Oh, I see what's wrong. Do you see my bug? I found the bug. Anyone? Buggy, buggy. Here I called the transformation on those columns, but I didn't actually reset it in the data frame. So there you go, bug found. And so here, let me go over again how I could tell that was a bug, just in case that wasn't clear. The result of scoring should be that there's a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Uh, but that wasn't the case for those three skewed metrics. So that's why I started looking. I was like, what's wrong here? Um, so it actually wasn't a problem with the mean and standard deviation. It was a problem with the, um, the that I wasn't properly scaling them. All right, let's try rerunning the score transformer again, now that I fixed it after closing these unnecessary tables of data. This is the original stats, that's worth keeping open. All right, so I am going to rerun the, the, that fat tails transformer code. I'm not gonna step through it again unless someone on the chat says that they didn't see it the first time. I'm just gonna like run through this and make sure my fix worked. So now let me rerun those stats. All right, so now chapter five, version two, so now I've resaved data set two summary stats. And let's see if I fixed it. Okay, the new stats, yes indeed. I have fixed my bug, so I am good. As you can see now, um, now for every column, the mean is essentially zero. The standard deviation is one. Also, those columns no longer have that high, that was the other thing that was clearly wrong in the last version. After the transformation, they're not supposed to have high skew or high kurtosis. And now all the columns don't have high skew or high kurtosis. Well, this one kind of has high kurtosis, but hey, nothing's perfect. It has moderate skew. Cool, all right, now I think I got my code to work for real. So yeah, I think that's it. That was my goal for the day. I put. I took this scoring formula and I put it into a new object um, that encapsulates the, the thing. So I think this, this is my, that was my live hack, finished the live hack. Now here's my summary of what we did today. So scoring, also known as normalization, if you're actually in this field, um, transforms data to a uniform scale. And I describe it like grading on a curve, if you're familiar with that with that. You kind of take, no matter what the original measurement is, you transform it to a p particular scale. So there's a log skew transform for data which is positive but has a high skew, and we reviewed that in the first part of the stream. And then there was the fat tails transform, which is for negative data with extreme value. And it refers to the tails of the distribution 
um, having a lot of data in them. Whereas for a normal distribution with kurtosis of three, uh, there's very thin tails. The tails basically disappear and there's nothing in the extremes of the distribution. Now, a transformer is an object that encapsulate, encapsulates a data pipeline function uh, like the one we were talking about. And the, the other thing I mentioned during the stream as a common use for data pipeline transformers is dimension reduction. And there is a dimension reduction section in the book. So the next stream, I'm gonna do a new transformer, which will be the dimension reduction transformer based on the book. So there you go. That's the summary of what we did. I don't know if anyone out there has any questions about what we did or uh, other random data science topics, if we want to debate like R versus Python, PyCharm versus VS Code, deep learning versus gradient boosting, you know, we all love that stuff. All right. Oh, wait, this is after my summary. I have an announcement. This is actually my special announcement. New, there's a new fight churn project from Manning Books. This is actually my big announcement for the week that I have created a new project for learning data science and churn on manning.com. So, big announcement. I forgot, I, I didn't properly prepare you for the big announcement, but if you wanna learn how to analyze data and churn on a real data set from a real company, it's very hard to do it because real companies won't give you their data. But Manning Books, my publisher, actually gives you their own data uh, and it's a live project here. I'm gonna like go to the live project to show you. So it's manning.com, that was bundles fight churn dash ser, I think short for series. So this is a, <clears throat> a three project series using Manning's live book data. So Man Manning, if you actually know live book, Livebook is for reading books live online, and you can read all your Manning books on Livebook. Now in this project, you will analyze the actual data from Manning's Livebook website. Um, and so this is a project for learning data science and learning the concepts of churn analysis and churn forecasting, um, all using a real data set. Looks like they charge $19.99 for it. Wow, for each section. Again, sorry for the prices. I have nothing to do with the pricing. Um, and my cut is very small, believe me. I don't make much money from this. I just do this for the fun and as a labor of love. But yes, this is a big announcement. You can now do a project using real data from manning.com. And that was a big work for me over the last year. Um, so just wanted to announce that special announcement. You can get it at manning.com bundles fighting churn dash ser for series so announcements i'm going to cover it in future streams i will actually do the project um, i want to finish up this transformer stuff first because i've been wanting to do it for a while and then soon after that we can actually maybe look at this project so that was my big announcement for the end of the stream let's see live stream schedule this is just my this is my outro um, I stream at 2 p.m. Pacific, which is my local time in California on Saturdays uh, when I'm available. Um, all this stuff is also available on demand on my YouTube site. I mean, all of my streams that actually have some good content in them, I, I put them up on YouTube. for, for the, But I don't know why I tell people on Twitch about that, because you're all Twitchers, obviously, if you're watching me now. And of course, this is where you can get that book um, I need to actually get a discount code for the live project series. I have to ask them if this discount code will work on the live project series. So I will check with my publisher and see if I can get you a discount code for the live project series or if this discount code can be made to work for it. I will follow up on that. And yes, please follow me on Twitter for updates about the stream and churn fighting data science. I don't post kitten pictures or anything about my personal life, which I'm sure you don't really want to know about. It's not that exciting. Um, well, I do occasionally post when I go camping for the weekend that I'm not live streaming. That's about as personal as I get to say that I'm going camping. I'm a private person, what can I say? 
All right, next week we will do dimension reduction with a transformer pipeline. And yes, that will be cool. Uh, it'll be a, a new, so still working on the transformers like I was doing today, but this will be a new kind of uh, transformer. So completely different topic. And I think I'm free next weekend. Wait a second. That says Saturday, September 18th, which is today. So this should say Saturday, September 25th, next weekend is when I will do that. And so, yeah, that's it. If no one else has any questions or subjects to discuss, I will check quickly if there's anyone worth rating. Very occasionally, um, there is, uh, you know, another data science or coding streamer that I follow who will be, you know, streaming in the afternoon. And if there's anyone like that, I can hand you off to them. Let's see. No, I don't see any of my favorite. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Twitch right now. You can't see, but I'm actually looking who's live on Twitch. I don't see any of my favorite data science streamers um, or programmers streaming right now. So I will just say goodbye for today. You never know what, who you can find to raid. Very occasionally. I know of two other data science streamers, three kind of, yeah. And very occasionally I can raid them at the end of my stream, but not today. So have a good rest of your Saturday, whatever time zone you're in. For some of you, it might be late at night. Uh, who knows, if anyone out there is in Australia or like, you know, Asia, it could be Sunday morning for you. Have a great Saturday night, Sunday, wherever you're up to. Um, I'm going to go enjoy the rest of my day. I think my dog, who you heard barking earlier, needs a walk. And yeah, after that, I think I'm going to a friend's house for dinner. So I got the rest of my day ahead of me, but it's been fun. It was fun learning about Transformers, and hopefully it was uh, fun for you too to watch me hack around. But enjoy the rest of your week. Happy data science. Happy data. I'm out. Goodbye.